Greetings, friends. My name is Pavel Stelmach, and I'm glad to present for you the new daily wrap-up episode. Dignity and Freedom Day is the first topic. On November 21st, we celebrate the Day of Dignity and Freedom in Ukraine. Nine years ago, on this day, people went to protest in many cities of Ukraine, the most in Kyiv, about one and a half thousand, which later grew into millions of protesters. The reason for the protest was the refusal of Prime Minister of Ukraine, Mykola Azarov, to sign the association agreement between Ukraine and the European Union. In 2013, Ukrainian authorities pursued a consistent policy of reproachment with Russia, not with Western partners. How it could have ended, we can see now on the example of Belarus. The tension of all political opponents, complaint opposition, involvement in the war on the side of the Kremlin. Who knows if the Ukrainian people had not protested in 2014, it is quite likely that the Kremlin war could not be on our territory, but in Georgia, the Middle East, or even worse, on the eastern borders of NATO. November 21st, 2013 was the manifestation of the political and state consciousness of the Ukrainian people, Ukrainian civil society and Ukrainian elites. And it seems to me that nine years ago few Ukrainians would have believed in what is happening now. That is the country with which we had the most cooperation back then, a country that for decades sought to call itself an elder brother and allegedly protect us. Remember at least the Budapest agreements, as a result of which Ukraine gave up nuclear weapons for the protection, protection by Russia. The largest country in the world in terms of territory will enroach on our lands and on the existence of the Ukrainian nation in general. So many events happened during these years that probably no Ukrainian will remember what he was thinking about in 2013, what plans he was making, what gifts he wanted to receive for the new year. Right now, each of us has a common wish, a peaceful sky, so that all loved ones are alive and healthy and return to their homes. But first of all, freedom. Because, as one Ukrainian politician said, if the people choose bread between bread and freedom, in the end, they will lose both, including bread. If the people choose freedom, they will have bread grown by themselves and not taken away by anyone. So we choose freedom. Yes, we pay a bloody price for that. Every day, dozens of Ukrainian soldiers lose their lives and health for their country, for their freedom, for the safety of their loved ones. However, it is not for nothing that our enzyme says, soul and body shall we lay down for our freedom. And hundreds of people lose their souls, with the civilians who died in this war, with the buildings destroyed by the occupiers, with small household items, with psychological problems that will now accompany us throughout our lives. The war in Ukraine will now affect every choice in our lives. It is good that our people have already made a fateful choice, twice, in 2013 and in 2004. And we went to the Maidan twice, in November. It's kind of revolutionary for us. However, those two revolutions showed that Ukrainians were not put up with the decisions of the authorities, when it is a decision of individuals and not millions. In 2004, during the Orange Revolution, Ukrainians rallied against massive election fraud and defended their right to self-determination. New presidential elections and ultimately the European way. The Russians had a similar situation in 2011, when after two presidential and one prime minister terms, Putin decided to run for president again. At that time, some Russians were against such usurpation. The majority of the Russian people wanted a strong hand. It is now in Russia, and it is sending Russians to be buried for strange purposes. After all, since February the 24th, the Kremlin has not formed the main goal of the attack on Ukraine. The Nazification and demilitarization do not count, because they are just small worlds that have no specifics. Unlike the Ukrainians, who clearly say, we want our land back, and after that, we will again go to the Independence Square, where the revolution of dignity began and only now for a mass celebration. It will be difficult for us to win, but we are ready to not be ashamed in front of posterity. And the second topic is Rishi Sunak's visit. The Prime Minister of Great Britain arrived in Ukraine on Saturday, without warning and unexpectedly for most. Ukrainians do not know him yet, but we will always wait for him in our country. 
especially with help. After all, according to the head of the British government, Great Britain hopes to host a conference on the reconstruction of Ukraine next year. Sunak also hopes to end this terrific war and ensure a world where there is rule of law, peace and respect to state sovereignty and those who have committed war crimes are brought to justice. And maybe it could be taken as just words. However, they are supported by actions. Rishi Sonak pledged new air defenses, 125 anti-aircraft guns and technology to counter Iranian drones, worth more than 50 million British pounds. Humanitarian support during the cold and harsh winter, a further 16 million British pounds in humanitarian aid. And such support is very important for us, because no one in the world has followed the elections of the Prime Minister in Great Britain as closely as the Ukrainians. After all, Boris Johnson is our crush. Yes, we know that in British politics he was ambiguous, with scandals during the quarantine and the difficult exit from the European Union, as well as high inflation rates, but for Ukrainians he was like a native. After all, during the first six months of Russia's large-scale war, he came to Ukraine three times, despite all security precautions. The politician was not afraid of shelling or rocket attacks. He was not afraid to simply walk on the streets of the city upon his arrival in Kyiv. This is bravery, and Ukrainians always love the brave. Of course, we are very sorry that Rishi Sunak's predecessor, Liz Truss, wasn't able to come to visit us as Prime Minister, but we still look forward to continued support, especially since the British fought many wars on Ukrainian soil. At least remember the Crimean War in the middle of the 19th century, when European countries fought for dominance in the Black Sea. By the way, from that war, the term Sin Red Line came about, as a symbol of an imaginary border that the enemy will not cross. Most Ukrainians didn't even know this expression until 2014. However, now we hear it almost every day from the Kremlin. They try to draw some boundaries for us, which we have no right to violate. It is good that we have only one red line. The state border of 1991. And we are not going to cross this line. And we would be very happy if our enemy did not cross it either and also to respect the state borders of neighboring countries and the sovereignty of states. With the help of our partners, we hope to reach the state borders in the near future. It is not for nothing that the Twitter account of the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine said that those who believe that the armed forces will stop have never sunbossed on the southern coast of Crimea. And we really want to soak up the sun under the gentle Crimean sun. And the last but not the least topic is the World Football Cup. On Sunday, the main football event of four years began, the World Cup. Fans know that this year it is unusual. It is held in autumn, in the middle of the desert, in a country where this type of sport is not very popular. However, for the world, it is notable for the fact that for the first time, the World Cup is taking place simultaneously with an active war in Europe. Although, to be honest, the previous one took place in Russia, the aggressor country. So we, Ukrainians, are not surprised at all. And the Russians still trying to convince the world that sport is outside of politics. But they always shout their narratives into sports. And attacks on their neighbors are also adjusted to big sporting events. On the opening day of the 2008 Summer Olympics, Russian troops openly entered the territory of Georgia. After all, all eyes were fixed on Beijing and not on the Caucasian country. The active phase of the annexation of Crimea began on February the 24th, the day after the end of the Winter Olympics in Sochi, so that no one would start boycotting the Olympics. And the full-scale attack on Ukraine three days after the end of the Olympic Games in Beijing. Good, even though Russia was suspended from participation in the World Cup. After all, I am sure that Kremlin propagandists would have managed to use this sports event for their own purposes. However, like Russia, Qatar uses a large-scale world sporting events to raise its image in the world. And now we will not dwell in detail on the old scandals in which Qatar were written by the world media. We will simply list 
deaths during the constructions of stadiums and infrastructure, bad treatment of labor migrants, low level of observance of human rights, persecution of LGBT people and other. I will also remind you about the scandal with the choice of the host country of the tournament. Even former FIFA president Joseph Blatter admitted that the decision to host the 2022 World Cup in Qatar was a mistake and football and the World Cup are too big for this country. However, not for local politicians. After all, they are ready for falsification in pictures in Qatar. Even now, the mass media are writing that thousands of men from Pakistan and India have been brought to the Arab country who should show great interest in the matches. However, such technology is not new for Ukraine, because Russia has repeatedly used such technologies in the occupied territories. Visitors to Crimea, Donbass and the territories occupied in 2022, are the norm for Russian television. After all, the Kremlin knows that no Ukrainian will greet the occupier with flowers and will continue his struggle despite everything. Even despite the fact that FIFA president Gianni Infantino proposed to stop the war in Ukraine during the World Cup. We know that any polls now will be in favor of Russia and therefore we have no right to stop our active actions on liberating the entire territory of Ukraine. That concludes today's video. Thank you very much for watching and stay tuned for our future videos. Goodbye.